Jennifer Manicharian and I recorded this episode of Story Power way back in April. And at the end of this episode, she talks about the importance of voting and registering to vote. Now, in April, there was some apathy going on about voting in the upcoming election, but she's right. Voting, no no matter when it happens, is important. So be sure that you are registered and please go vote for your selected candidate. And also be sure that you know what your candidate stands for. So I hope that you enjoy this episode because Jennifer has so many creative things that she's done in her life and being an advocate for vote for voters and for voting is just one of the things that she has done. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Story Power. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I chat about stories and creativity in all different styles and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and my goal is to promote what Dale Carnegie stated in his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. It's my firm belief that the goal of most creative people is to try to understand themselves and others. That's what makes artwork of all kinds so compelling. But more than that, the personal stories of my guests promote understanding as well. Roger C. Shank, a cognitive scientist, said, Human beings are not ideally set up to understand logic. They are ideally set up to understand stories. It's my hope that story power will help us understand each other better by sharing the stories of my guests. Today is episode 112, and I'm talking to Jennifer Manicharian. Is that how you say your name? Perfect. That's it. You got it. You nailed it. Oh, good. I guess my theater training uh, paid off there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I am so happy to have you on the show today because you have so many things that you've done that are exciting and especially all the theater stuff that I love producing and (laughs) and, uh, doing music, writing musical books and uh, your screenwriting, uh, and I want to hear about your book as well because I went and read the uh, description and it looks r- really interesting. So, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you. I hope you'll read my book. It doesn't have much theater in it. <laughs> but... Oh, oh no, that's okay. <laughs> do you do you follow New York theater? Uh. Mm. No, not really anymore because I'm, well, I was, when I was teaching, I guess I did more, but not teaching theater anymore. And um, I'm so busy with my podcast and writing my books and blog and stuff that I don't follow. I totally understand. Our lives get very full for those of us who kind of are nuts and and you're not nuts. I am. (laughs) Live over (laughs) Live over full lives, but it's good. All good. It's all good. So I have a question, um, or maybe I'll let you just talk about what you want to talk about first, and then I have some questions that might come up. So, Um, no, I mean, listen, I would, I love to talk about my book because I hope it will interest people will want to want to see it. It's called Alphabet, B E T T E. Although some people say Betty and I don't care if they buy it. I don't care how they say it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, and it's, 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 it's about so many things. It's about um, family. It's about 
grieving. It's about love. It's about loss. It's, you know, it's about life in its many forms. And there's, it's told from different points of view. Mm -hmm. There's seven different characters and they all have their own uh, chapters, but they all, they, they all kind of um, revolve off of, I revolve isn't the right word, but kind of the mainstay of the book is the character Bet, mm -hmm. who's 95. And she decides it all happens over the course of a day, but you get to know everybody's backstories too. Mm -hmm. But during that day, she wakes up and makes a decision at 95 and having not had a dinner party in many years that that night she's going to have a dinner party it's like a command performance <laughs> and <laughs> and she has there aren't many people left in her life at her age but she mm -hmm. she has a daughter a great granddaughter a uh, couple of people who work for her a couple of neighbors and they're all to be at that dinner party and nobody knows what's up <laughs> and she's also invited a medium so they're all a little bit nervous but obviously as in any story or any play or any film they each have a story arc and something that's mm -hmm. at stake for them that has to be resolved as well as for bet and she's kind of the puppeteer and <laughs> but they all they're all in they all have connections in different ways. And in fact, one of the connections they have is all through Bet's late husband, George, he, who's been dead about five years. Mm -hmm. But but I at one point I thought of having kind of have him as a ghost type person. But instead of that, he's kind of a through line in a way in that everybody had connections to him. Mm -hmm. And they come they 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 they're kind of rooted into their stories in different ways. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I I hope. And the ending surprises many people. And um, I'm working on my second book, which is real, which is based on one of the a couple of the characters in my first book, and you know what goes on for them afterwards. And so, in any event, novel writing has come to me very late in life. <laughs> I'm in my 80s, so it's like it's it's something that never ever did I think I'd be writing a novel, but now I'm hooked. I love, I, I really enjoy writing this way. So I'm having fun. Oh, good. I'm so glad because I did, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was like 54 or something like that. And huh. then and what was it? Well, what, uh, what was it you wanted it to do? It was writing. Yeah. And then, and then during the pandemic, when I learned how to use Zoom, because we were teaching over Zoom, which was really interesting. Right. Teaching. Acting well, I do that too. Oh, teaching acting. Well, that's challenging, but I teach screenwriting over Zoom. Oh, that's and, easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, when I learned how but to acting, do that. Oh. Yeah, that was tough. And we had to do it for two or three semesters, which was, that was oh. interesting. But uh, when I learned how to use that, I had been thinking about doing a podcast for a while because I love stories and since I was a child I've analyzed them and looked at the characters and why are they doing what they're doing and you know that kind of thing and when you're in theater you know theater people they analyze the story down to the minutest little detail <laughs> so well they have to, well, actors, well actors have to understand their character what motivates them they have to become someone else right right exactly they have so to they have to internalize it. But even the director has to do all that analyzation too, because you, you know, got to decide which theme are we going to emphasize and, you know, well, you know, and so, uh, yeah, I just started podcasting and I really love it. So now I'm juggling the writing. And the so podcast. we, well, you never know, maybe you have more chapters. I mean, we keep evolving. I mean, those of us, I think when you, when you have kind of a creative nature, Mm -hmm. it it kind of morphs a little but it's like mm -hmm. everything is useful you don't give up anything but it just it's an i think it has an additive value yes well i mean what i mean by juggling is i just finished the rough draft of my sequel to my first novel and you know i have to work on it a little bit every day before i get the next podcast recording done or ready to publish or, uh, you know, write my blog or whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, it's, I have to kind of, you know how it goes because you have that kind of life. Well, to me, 
I, in fact, I last night I saw one a play that's just opening called Sufs. It's about the suffragettes. Oh, right. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and and I was I had lunch, I had dinner with a friend, and we were talking, and she, we were talking about how, you know, we 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 create our own adventures in life, and you can sit home and maybe do nothing, and your life is. It's kind of, I mean, I, I don't mean to judge anybody else's life. It really has to do with your own nature, your your level of curiosity, mm -hmm. your level of wanting to be engaged in things. Mm -hmm. And and it's not like one is good and one is bad. It's just that my nature is such, and I certainly come by it honestly because my parents were like that, that you create your life. You make an adventure of it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come at you. You got to go for it. Mm -hmm. And every, I mean, every day, I, I never, my husband can never believe me, but I never, there's not enough hours in a day for all the things I may want to do on any day. Mm -hmm. it's just my, and my life has been, I mean, when you talk about what happened with COVID, well, COVID was why I wrote this book, because all of a sudden my office closed in New York City oh, right. and theaters shut, shut down and right. I had this block of time. And so... It's my. It changed my life because I haven't. Now I do. I'm. I'm really do different things now. I don't. Uh, theater is. Uh, I would. I never say. I. I would like to say I never say never, but it would take an awful lot to make me want to get involved because most shows now have about. I'm. I'm not exaggerating. Up to fifty producers, and so your level of involvement. Your level of involvement. I mean, they just need. You have to raise money. I mean, shows have become yes. ridiculous. I don't want to get caught up in talking about theater, but it's become really, really hard to finance a show and the running costs are expensive. And so you need a ton of people to finance it. Mm -hmm. And so th to me, the the fun was, was more when you had a more active involvement. And to me, just, you know, to raise money isn't as interesting to me. No. Yeah. I was going to ask if there were any other uh, duties that a producer had besides raising money. But maybe not. Oh, there's a was it to define it? Uh, what a producer does would be a whole podcast because it's there's there's no one definition. It can be you can be a uh, glorified investor or you can be the person what's called the lead producer mm -hmm. who finds the property, works, finds the director, puts everybody together, mm -hmm. has an involvement in in so at times depending mm -hmm. upon the creative team in. Mm -hmm you know in shaping it creatively who then when the show opens uh, is in charge of marketing it and, and everything else i mean that's a big yeah. that's a huge job and that's a very exciting job but most of the people who are above title these days don't get to do any of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so there's you can define producer you know it's there's, there's no one definition but so writing is really more your emphasis now, both your novel and screenwriting and helping screenwriters. Is that your main? Well, thing? I have, I have, I have various focuses. Actually, um, I'm also working, I've written a couple of musicals, the book of the musical. I work right. with a team, mm -hmm. a musical writing team, and we're working on a musical series with the director that it'll be, it'll be a, I, a podcast isn't the right word, but we're hoping to stream it. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I'm still, we, it started out as a, something we thought would be a musical for theater, but because it's so hard to make things happen, we've decided to stream it and do it in a different way. So, I mean, that's another project I'm working with. And I also, last year, a movie that I had spent 10 years developing, I had optioned the book that, on which it was based about 10 years ago. And I wound up writing the screenplay. Mm -hmm. And then when we got a few, I mean, it's been a very long process, but when I finally had a script that I felt was ready, I, I a producer got involved with me. She and I are co-producing it. She's, she's kind of does a lot of the work of it, but I'm very involved also in it as a producer. And we got a wonderful director, um, just tons of delays along the route, but we filmed it in minnesota and the, the the director did her own pass on it so she's a co-writer of it too mm -hmm. and it's called boundary waters and it's about it's this it's a story that's unfortunately always relevant 
but it hasn't been done quite this way. It's about uh, the tra a family trauma. It's usually done from the point of view of the victim, mm -hmm. but this is done from the point of view of a 12 year old child of the victim, so to speak. And it's done from a child's perspective. So it's also about childhood, but he sees his mother is changed by something that's happened. He doesn't know what it is. And she doesn't want anybody to know. She wants it to be a secret. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's kind of how everything unfolds. You know, there's no such thing as a secret that doesn't ultimately come out. Right. At least in a, in, mostly in life, but certainly in film. And it's, and it's, and there was a quote I read about secrets anyhow, and, or even about family trauma. And that is that it's a social event. It affects the individual, mm -hmm. it affects the family, it affects the community. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious movie, but it's not heavy handed. It's not, you know, there's nothing a 12 year old couldn't see. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's all about the, the, re, the repercussions rather than about the person who did something and mm -hmm. um, the trial or anything else. So I, so I also wrote that and, and it was produced last year in Minnesota and we're still, we filmed it in Minnesota mm -hmm. and, and we're still, um, we're, we're working on uh, trying to get it into a festival and making decisions about how it's going to be distributed. So that's also act, you know, that's also on my front burner. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you, I, I wonder if you're like me, I wake up in the morning and I have a list of things I want to get done in the day. Absolutely. Cause <laughs> I, I, I'm just to throw in a couple of others. I'm also involved in a couple of boards. And I mean, one of them actually, it, um, the move, the play I saw last night made me um, think about a way of connecting the play with what we're doing because the suffs the music of the musical that opened is about mm -hmm. the suffragette with these people mm -hmm. women wanting the vote now mm -hmm. we have people who can be registered to vote who don't vote and so mm -hmm. i'm very actively involved in an organization called 18 by vote which is an attempt to get people to register to vote particularly young people right. because nobody seems to care about you know everybody's so kind of either sick of it or can't make a, whatever it is you've got to I don't care what if you live in this country you should be a voter you should vote it's mm -hmm. part of your citizenship mm -hmm. so that's another thing I mean and then there's another nonprofit having to do with trying to make this a better world so my and I also have a big family so oh, wow. my life has many different branches <laughs> yes that's great yeah I love it yeah, uh, uh, my second book has the whole suffragette suffragist thing in it too. Yeah, and oh. it's two timelines. So the one of the women in the past is uh, working in the suffrage movement, the original suffrage movement, and then her three times great granddaughter is now working, you know, on what's going on now. So, yeah. What do you mean now? Are you now, talking about now in, today? Now today, yeah she's in the present oh. well the, it's not so much as getting the vote it's as getting people to vote yeah and and also it's uh it's all of the thing legislation and things that are now trying to curtail women's rights and that kind of thing that's what she's uh -huh. working on so you and I are on the same page, Lucinda. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I am not somebody who goes out and does all this volunteering and I'm not on boards and things. But, you know, I do I, I make comments on my blogs. You know, I talk about it on my blog posts and on my podcasts. And, you know, well, that's listen, not, every, not everybody has to be on a board to be effective. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, on a board. I mean, it, they're all grassroots efforts anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, right. but you know, for example, on my, when my grandchildren, when they turn 18, I, I did, well, actually, when was it? It was, it was for Christmas. I, I gave, I gave every, all the kids, I gave them, uh, among other things, I gave them, um, a registration <laughs> so they could register mm -hmm. to vote. I, I, I printed up the registration for New York. I mean, I, I yeah. believe in, I, I push them a lot. I mean, I have my own political agenda, but I, I think I don't want to get involved in politics per se, but I, 
I think everybody should be a voter. I think you're going to care. Yeah. And you have to not only just vote, but you have to pay attention to what the candidates are saying and you have to do your own little research and, and then pick totally. the one you think is best. Yeah. Right. Totally. I love well, you that. Well, you can go to vote and you'll find there's a bond there that you've never heard of. I mean, there's a lot of things that may be on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So you have to be informed. Well, but, what but it's there's just tremendous apathy. People are really turned off and it's really too bad. Mm -hmm. We have company. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I was going to say when I was eight, I think I was 18 when they passed the law that 18 year olds could vote. I didn't get to vote in, in a presidential election until I was 19. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's great that 18 year olds get to vote now. So now who is your visitor? Who's your my visitor is uh, one of my two cats. Um, she it's a male he's named well he has a persian yes. name my husband's iranian and, oh. and his name is like it means like naughty in iranian <laughs> it's shaytuni and, and whenever i'm sitting here oh. this is where i write she jumps on my lap and then she starts <laughs> playing on the keyboard and messes me up but i can't there's nothing i can do about it i'm not gonna not want to have her right but I've, I have cats, I have dogs. All my life, I've had animals. Animals, I think, are important for our emotional well-being. Oh, yes. It's so true. Yes. Our animals are out in the yard. <laughs> we watch the quail. Well, and that's the, good, too. And the deer and the javelina. And all, you know, the, Barry said he came home from work the other day, and there was a coyote running through our yard. Oh, my word. What's a javelina? A uh, javelina looks like a pig, but it's not. It's a, um, in fact, there's this really great children's book called Don't Call Me Pig. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I can't remember what family it's in, but they're, they are not very nice to be around. So you, when you see them, you have to, yeah, and they're fairly large. Uh, you have to kind of. Oh, well, I'll look it up. Stay away I'm from them. look it up when we yeah. get them off. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think I have to worry because I don't think I'm going to be seeing one in the Northeast. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, you won't. They're, they're a Southwestern. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'll, have to, I'll have to travel to have the experience. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, uh, they're also kind of a pack animal. So they have, um, you know, whenever they come oh. through our yard, it's like eight or nine <laughs> of them. Oh, wow. Know, Drinking out of the trough and eating the bird seed and you know, stuff like that. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun having all these fun animals going through our yard. Get the it is. It sounds nice. I mean, yeah. my one of my daughters has a farm and it's it's great. Oh, but all, yeah. all of my kids have animals. Where I mean, I have five children and they have kids. Then, in fact, their adult kids all have animals. And it's kind of interesting because Sundays I have like open house, whoever's around comes. Uh -huh. And and sometimes they come with their four-legged family members and it can be pretty wild. If it was every <laughs> once in a while, we'll have a fight. We had a fight. The I have one of my grandsons, his wife is having a baby shortly. Oh. And they have a big dog that they brought with them. And their, their dog came and one of my dogs, they were, you know, they're having fun together. But then all of a sudden it turned into a fight. And my poor, my granddaughter-in-law, Laura, she was screaming and, and it was really kind of, it can be scary because when dogs mm -hmm. fight, they go for the jugular. They don't kid around. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's, but if I have to ask some people, please don't bring your dog. It's not that I don't like dogs, but I don't know what kind of mayhem is going to result from it. Right. Yeah. So bring babies, but don't bring your dogs, but they do anyway. So <laughs> I don't <laughs> So we figure it out. <laughs> yes, really. So have you lived in New York all your life? I've lived in the Northeast all my life. I grew oh. up in Connecticut. Oh. But you know, I mean it's I I'll i I'll die in the Northeast too, unless I'm traveling somewhere wonderful and die. That's okay. But <laughs> I've always I've, I've, in fact, I'm probably pretty unique in that I have, I lived in a, when we were born, I lived in one home. We moved to Connecticut. That's the second home. 
Then my parents moved to an apartment building in the city, third, and I'm now in my fourth. I've only been in four homes in my life. Oh, yes, I think you are and, unique. Yeah, and my my parents moved into a building um, in on Central Park West in the city. It, and that was in 1955. One of my sisters was going to school in the city then. Mm -hmm. And since that time, that building, which is the apartment that's in my book, is like another character to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it's kind of a New York City sensibility to it. Mm -hmm. And because that building, it's an incredible building. It's an, it's a pre-war building, which means they have the big windows and the big oh. tall ceilings. And it's, it's a wonderful building. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. since now I have three children living there. Oh. My, but I've never not had family members in that building since that time. Wow. So we lived in there for a time. And then my, my parents, my mother, my father died in 98, my mother in 2000. So it's like tw oh, 24 years now that they haven't been there. But I've still had a presence in that building. So I used, I used my parents' apartment mm -hmm. as a model in my mind for the apartment, even though I placed it on West End Avenue. I don't know if you New York City, but I didn't place it where it was just because mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be a clone of their building or, you know, it's right. not my family. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there's bits and pieces of all of us in there, but in my book, but for whatever reason, I didn't place the building where the building, where the apartment in my mind was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like when my sisters read my books, they could picture everybody. They could picture it all. Yes. And my, and my job as a writer was to try to help the reader picture it too, mm -hmm. uh, which was which was very it, it, which is hard because when you do screenwriting or playwriting, you know you've got a camera or you've got an audience right. to, to do a lot of the work for you. You don't mm -hmm. in terms of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing novels, probably the hardest part for me, it wasn't creating character because that I always do in whatever I write. Right, and that that's kind of where you begin. But it's about it's about showing people where you are, just having, you know, I, for me, I put it as I'm being the camera, right? being in the being, being able to show people what's what I'm what I'm seeing in my mind. Yes. And also I had that problem, too, because when I started writing my novel, it was almost all dialogue <laughs> to start with. And then I and then I had to do that, fill in the smells and the sights and the sounds. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, because that's because you do theater. Well, in fact, when I I have I I work with a writing group, and I'm a very big believer mm -hmm. in having your village around you. I mean, you just need that perspective, that feedback. Mm -hmm. But one of the, but my group when they I only showed maybe two drafts over the period of time, you know, there's a limit to how much you can ask of people. Mm -hmm. And so, but when I felt I had a draft that I was ready to share, and then when I shaped it up, I, sh I had them look at, no, you can't eat my food. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking to my cat. <laughs> but but um, the first one of people saying it reads like a play or it reads like a movie. So I thought, mm -hmm. oh, wow. All right, back to the drawing board. I have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the dialogue you know you find in fact even in the dialogue even if you have good dialogue it's not just the dialogue you've got to as you say you've got to be they got to move their hand while they talk or there's mm -hmm. something the doorbell rings or you know there's so much that happens in between just conversation mm -hmm. um that you yeah. just can't and you know and then you figure out what's in, what's relevant and what isn't relevant right yeah it's such a long process People, I don't, I think people who are not writers don't understand. Even if you're doing, even when I do my blog posts, it's not, I don't just sit down and write it and then publish it. I have to edit it. Oh, well, once you have a draft, I'm working on the first draft of my second novel and mm -hmm. I'm pretty far along. Mm -hmm. But once I have that done, I'm going to, that's where I'm beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, it's, it'll be, I know I'll, I'll have a long road ahead, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, you have to, if it's something you want to do and you, it's like, you have to do it. It's like mm -hmm. you write because you don't have a choice. But one of the things that writing a novel has done for me is, uh, as you said, people who don't write me not. when I pick up a book now, or you do an ebook, whatever it is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a whole different view of it because I realize 
somebody just didn't sit in, in, in Rome and write, whether it was a typewriter or word process or whatever it was, you don't just write a book and give it to an editor or a publisher and it goes into the world and you're done with it. How I mean, the process of getting a book, it's the the amount of things you have to do. Let's just say, I mean, like me, I do have my writing group. And so I and I send it to people whose views I trust. I have a lot of feedback. And then one thing I did, which if normally if you write a book and it's traditionally published, when you want and when you get an agent, they'll usually want to do a developmental edit, which means somebody mm -hmm. who really comes in and and gives you very strong notes on how to make your book a better book. Mm -hmm. But what I did was I did the I I did that process before I thought I was finished. I, I wanted to have it in really good shape. Mm -hmm. And so I had already done that process. But first it can take you months or years to or maybe never to get an agent. Mm -hmm. Then when you get an agent, the agent's going to want to make all sorts of changes. Mm -hmm. When you finish that process, then you're going to want to, the agent's going to have to find a publisher, which may or may not happen. And the publisher may want to want other changes. Yes. And then you go into the schedule and it may not be for two years before it comes out. That's right. In fact, I mean, and then, and then you have to sell, you have to learn how to sell your own book. You don't just write a book. These days, at least, you have to be able to sell it. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's it, how much you, you don't, you can't just be a writer of your book. You've got to also be the seller of your book, yes. the marketer of the book. That's and right. in fact, I chose, I chose not to even go through the process of trying to find an agent because at my age, I don't have years. Right. I, I don't, you know, I, I can't wait three years to finally see a book out. I chose to do a hybrid publisher, which are selective. Mm. They only take like 15% of public what's sent to them. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think it required any, any work much. And it's, that was like six months from the time I had signed a contract with them to getting it out there. So that was fantastic. Yes. I, you know, you don't have the same marketing. You don't have the publisher behind you doing some of the marketing, mm -hmm. but to be honest with you, I'm glad because I have friends, who, they're being you know, you can be sent to San Francisco to get, to go to some, um, you know, to talk at bookshops and 10 people show up or something. Yes. I mean, it's really, it's so labor intensive. Yes. So writing a book, just don't ever think you just write a book and that's it. The book, the book that you think you're reading has got a lot gone into making it happen. Yes. And, and that's why whenever I read a book, I don't give it really bad reviews, although there have been books where I did not understand why they, why the person wrote that book. I wasn't involved with the characters, <laughs> you know, but that doesn't mean that somebody isn't going to get something out of that book. Well, I mean, but that's like getting an A for effort rather than an A for achievement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, it's, I'd rather not review a book I didn't like if, if, you know, you're very generous. Right. Yeah. I don't, usually I don't review books that I don't like. Uh, I may give it some stars, but I won't write anything about it. You know, yeah. I well, only I think, write something I, about the ones I really liked. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we're going to trust the stars and we're going to trust what people say, you know, there's a point of, it's really, it's tough. You know, you don't want to be unkind. I, I understand how you feel, but listen, if you're willing to put yourself out there, you got to take what you get. That's true. The part yeah. of putting yourself out is really, that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, if, and, it, and I'll tell you, it's one thing with writing a book because I, you know, the, I, I've had, I've been very fortunate that I've had good reviews. I mean, I haven't had I've had a couple, a couple of I don't get it or whatever, but mostly I've had really good reviews. But mm -hmm. when you're and so I I can read them, but there's you know I I have to go after them to read them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I've done uh, musicals and I'm sitting in an audience, I know what the audience is thinking. Mm -hmm. I it's and that is really really hard for me. The exposure you do when you put yourself out in theater to me is is very hard. I always think I've got something terrible that's going to kill me. I mean, I get really, I mean, my, my body really responds to it. I find it mm -hmm. very, very hard. 
but I keep doing it. I mean, I don't know. I'm a glutton for punishment. I, it doesn't stop me from doing it <laughs> because right. I do it because I love to do it. I don't do it because I'm waiting. For, it's not about the end. It's about them doing it. Right. It's about the process of doing it. Right. It's not about the accolades. Yeah. No. You yeah. know, I wrote this because I'm, I feel good about it. It mm -hmm. was, I never thought I could do it. It it was, I, you know, I'm proud of it. Yeah. It's hard for me to say I'm ever proud of anything. It's funny, but mm -hmm. I, I'm proud that I did it and I worked that hard. And, and yeah. it's, so it's really, you have to be your own judge as well. That's right. Yeah. Otherwise you get really whipped around. That's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have about five minutes left. Do you have anything that I didn't ask you or that you want to say? Well, tell me, t well, I, I, I always, as my husband says, I like to talk. I always have something to say. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm a choker. Oh, that and happens. I just in some air. Oh, dear. So I may not have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the last thing I say. Tell me, is there something that your audience likes most to hear about people? Well, I have a wide range of guests. And mostly, uh, ever since I had a session with some women from Douglas who, who are in charge of the oral Douglas Oral History Project, I realized that, you know, every life is a library. So I'll talk to people who don't even, who aren't even considered creative, if you want to, everyone's creative in my view, but, you know, I talk to lots of different people and I just want to hear about their lives and what they're doing and what they're doing if they're creative. So that's. You're a, you like stories. Well, I do too. Mm -hmm. And you cannot be a writer. And uh, I, I mean, stories are of tremendous interest to me. And but, well, uh, what I'll say is my last thing it has to do with stories also. But I got to take some more water. I apologize. It's all right. Oh, it's very annoying when this happens. You know, I'm one of the boards that I'm on. Mm -hmm. It was called the peace the peace studio, and the goal of the peace studio is to try to to kind of well to make to reduce it to its simplest form. And I'm going to cough again. <laughs> it's just to make people kinder, uh, mm -hmm. less judgmental, less seeing divisions between people. Just kind of a better world that we really need. Mm -hmm. And the way that's done is by supporting artists who go into their communities with all artists in all different mediums and journalists mm -hmm. who give messages of, of tolerance and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And what's been discovered, and, you know, I, I always, this is the same with the voting thing. I always thought, like, you know, with voting, like, you know, Taylor Swift will sing a song and tell everybody to register. Well, people will maybe buy her song, but it may not motivate them to register. Mm -hmm. so what I've learned is that the getting getting movement is really very grassroots. Mm -hmm. And in in the peace studio, what we found is that the way in which you engage people is by telling stories that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that people that resonate with the people in the specific communities where they live, so they so that it, it has relevance to their lives mm -hmm. and storytelling is is just our best way of helping people look at different cultures different you know the problems people have different it, it can just make you it broadens mm -hmm. your mind mm -hmm. and it, and it's interesting because being as old as i am you know i i'll read things about what helps you with aging and stuff like that and a lot of it's reading fiction where you you where you there are different ways in which it it, it actually expands our mind and it's useful to our brain mm -hmm. but i think stories listening to reading reading listening to people's stories that's the heart of beginning to understand our basic humanity we're all we all mm -hmm. have so many of the we're all going to die <laughs> we all were we may not have our own nuclear families but we all grew up in a family or grew up with 
but somebody gave birth to us somewhere along the mm -hmm. line. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we all have a family of one sort or another. So I think stories are really at the heart of what matters in this world. And it's a, it's a pity that that everybody doesn't read more and un, in order mm -hmm. to get more understanding of, I mean, there's nothing like reading an ethnic novel to understand a different culture. Right, exactly. Well, we have about a minute left. And I agree with you that stories are important because you get to live somebody else's life and you get to live in another yeah. place. So yeah. I, I, I just loved our conversation. And thank you so much for thank being you, my Lisa. guest. Well, it was my pleasure. I have a website if anybody's interested. Yes. It's just, it's, it's, it's just my name, Jennifer Manichurian, if you can spell that. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be put I'll out have anywhere. show notes. Yes. Oh. All right, yes. jennifermanichurian.net. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, please share it with a friend and give us a rating and or review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. I invite you to join my Patreon community at patreon.com slash story power, all one word. Or if you like, you can subscribe to Story Power on Apple Podcasts. It's my aim to build a community where we discuss the stories we love and talk about what we learned from them. I offer extra audio content and story suggestions to my patrons on both platforms. Remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Let's spread the story love. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.